scripture reading will be from Hebrews 2, 9 through 13. Hebrews 2, 9 through 13. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him who for whom all, are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sacrifices, sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in you. And again, here I am, the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. We're so thankful that Brother Emmanuel has come our way. He is uh, one of the founding members of the school. He, uh, along with uh, several other men there, he is our first director at the school. He has preached for many, many years, and we're so excited that we could have him here tonight to preach for us. Uh, we uh, just want to let you know tonight we're going to look at Jesus Christ, God's Son, and uh, then throughout the week he, there's a series of lessons that we're going to discuss uh, about salvation and in the church. And we're so excited for Manuel to be here for our meeting, and uh, we we look forward to each of his lessons. And uh, at this time, Manuel will bring a lesson on Jesus Christ, God's Son. Again, I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad that Andy showed up tonight. <laughs> uh, I know Andy is a, a busy man and uh, has to do a lot of legwork for the school, and I'm glad that he is willing to do that. I totally understand what that's like. You do a lot of running, but uh, it uh, pays off in students. And we are glad that uh, you are here tonight. God has blessed us abundantly that we have had safe travel and uh, have, uh, we flew into Columbus and drove down and uh, we did that so we could see some of our children and grandchildren and so any opportunity that we are close by to see them, we'll, we'll take advantage of it. I am really thankful for the relationship that we have had with this congregation. Oh, a gospel meeting in the late 1980s and then becoming the director of the school in 1994 and uh, even after I uh, stopped being the director, I have continued teaching. And so uh, we have now, let's see, we're past uh, 27 years at least uh, that we have been uh, in, the, uh, in the employ of this congregation. You are still helping us, and I want you to know how much we appreciate it and uh, that we always need the help of our brethren. But you know, the church has provided for me and my family for now going on 57 years. And uh, I think that that is a tribute to God's people that uh, that they see the necessity of gospel preachers and men who are able and willing to give their lives in dedication to the service of God. We want to look at uh, 
Jesus, and uh, actually the title of my lesson is Four Views of Jesus. And uh, when we study about Jesus, it's, it's like trying to study about God. There are so many things that we want to know that are mysterious to us in many ways and beyond our understanding in other ways. And uh, as we said about the Bible this morning, it is such a book that it takes a lifetime and even in a lifetime, you do not ever come to a, a full grasp of everything that the Bible can say and that God can teach us. And, and so to dedicate a person's life, uh, to have many years to read and study and, and, uh, and learn and put into practice, these are the things that, uh, that just make a good life, a good Christian life. God is blessed, I believe, by those activities. But uh, angels and prophets. Peter said, wanted to look into all that was being said about Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and so when we try to look into this, we have a lot more knowledge than those angels and prophets. But yet at the same time, there are many things that we want to know. And hopefully one day we can ask the Lord ourselves and ha take advantage of that association and fellowship. There are dozens of metaphors that describe Christ. Uh, when we think of the uh, Jesus being the good shepherd and his association with the word sheep, he is in John 10 the good shepherd but he is also the door of the sheep. Micah chapter 3 and verse 12 refers to him as the breaker, the lead ram, if you will, that goes before the flock. And uh, uh, in verse, I believe, verse 14, it refers to him as the King and the Lord, spelled with all capital letters, that's the Lord Jehovah the greatest name for God in the Bible. And so the, uh, he, is, he is the one that goes before us. He is the captain of our salvation. But also he is, he is our Passover, another reference to lambs. And he is the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John said of him. And so tonight I want to look at four views of Christ. And I'm sure that we have to begin where John did in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning. And all things were, that were made were uh, made by him. And so, Jesus in eternity, the Jesus who came in the flesh in eternity was known as the Word. The, uh, he is eternal. Micah said of him in chapter 5 and verse 2 that his goings forth are from everlasting. He is one that has no end. Uh, Isaiah called him the mighty God. And, uh, and the everlasting Father. But that's referring to Christ, even in that term, Father. What a, and, and so the, the amount of description of Jesus in eternity shows that he is deity. He was deity before he became man. He is deity now. He it was deity when he walked the earth. And so here is deity, God. You know, it's hard to describe deity, isn't it? Uh, 
John said God is a spirit. And so how do you describe a spirit? How do you de describe a personage that is real and true, but you can't see or you can't touch, you can't identify with any of your physical senses? But three persons in the Bible are referred to as deity. God, the Father, and Jesus Christ in eternity as the Word and the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, we can look at this as uh, angels. You know, the, the book of Revelation talks about myriads and myriads of angels worshiping and falling down before him. And so the angels uh, are, uh, would seem to be almost numberless. But these are angels. They're not deity. They're not human. But when we think of humans, we can count them. And we have nearly 8 billion, perhaps even by now, we have surpassed 8 billion souls living at one time in this world. But there are only three that can be called God. Three that are deity. And so this word uh, that, uh, that came from heaven, the manna that came from heaven, John 6. And so titles describe differing aspects of his work, his function, uh, uh, his mission. And, and so we, we look first at the Word. Jesus Christ in eternity. The Word. But he is also known by the title of Son of God. And uh, the Father acknowledged Jesus as his Son when Jesus was, came to be baptized of John. He submitted to the baptism of John and uh, uh, God said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then uh, he was acknowledged by God again at the Mount of Transfiguration. When God said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Listen to what he says. Moses and Elijah were transfigured uh, before these uh, uh, apostles too. But it was Jesus that they were listened to, listened to, the Son of God and the one that uh, God acknowledged. As uh, perhaps uh, some of you know, Judy and I were fortunate this past uh, winter a year ago uh, to go to Israel. And uh, it was just a whirlwind trip of um, 10 or 11 days, something like that. But I'm telling you, we were up at 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning, every morning, eating breakfast by 6.30, on the bus at 8 o'clock, and traveling after, till after dark. And so we covered the land of Israel. One of the places that I wanted to go especially was Caesarea Philippi. And you know, uh, Caesarea Philippi is in a remote place. It's up clear up at the top of the land of Israel. Now, Israel is not a very big country. I remember when Dan Kessinger went on that trip, he said, I was just amazed at how small it is. You can drive all around Israel in a car uh, in just a few hours. But the things to see, and I, uh, you know, it makes you wonder, why did Jesus take his apostles from around the Sea of Galilee up to that remote area in the mountains? You're in the shadow of Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in that region, over 9,000 feet high and snow covered um, all year long. My doctor is Jewish, and we talk about Israel a lot. 
And when I saw him a few weeks ago, he said that uh, he has been at Mount Hermon and uh, there's a restaurant at the base of the mountain. And he said you can be sitting there on a 90 degree day and snowflakes will come down from Mount Hermon on you. But that's where Jesus took his apostles. Caesarea Philippi was a place of the God Pan. I would guess that when Jesus went there in the first century, there were Greek ruins of this God Pan. Pan was a deity that uh, was uh, worshipped as the god of the woods. You have seen pictures of him. He has a, a head of a goat and feet of a goat, but the body of a man. Or of, of, rather, I'm sorry, of a goat. The body of a goat and the head of a man. Uh, and Jesus went there and he asked the, the apostles, who do you say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But who do you say I am? Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he had the right answer, of course. But Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. Why did Jesus take his apostles there to teach them that lesson? This is one of the sources right there of the, sea of, or of the uh, Jordan River. Beautiful place. And of course now all of the uh, things that pertain to the God Pan are pretty much gone. There's a uh, uh, lots of things that show. There's a big cave there that they used to throw sacrifices into, even human sacrifices, that they would throw them into that cave, in the, the pool in there. But Jesus, upon this rock, and it's a huge ledge of rock, way up high and flat, you just walk down that way and it used to be all these Greek temples there. I believe Jesus was showing them that he was greater than any God. It's a, it's a long walk from Galilee up to that area. But Jesus went there on purpose to show them that he is greater than any God that can be made by man and the figment and the mind and the imagination of man. He is the one and Peter's confession of him as the Christ, the Son of God, is the rock on which the church is founded. But, uh, and so Peter confessed him at Caesarea Philippi as the Son of God. Jesus was confessed by demons as being the Son of God, Mark 5 and verse 7. And uh, uh, the, uh, the centurion said, surely this was the Son of God <clears throat> when Jesus was crucified. And so the, the, uh, this affirmation of him being the son of God was recognized by deity God himself and acknowledged by all of these humans that came in contact with him as the Christ. What was it about Jesus that showed that he was God? Well, many of the signs and wonders and miracles that he performed. This was the evidence that God was giving. And when uh, God told Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this, 
But my Father in heaven, well, what was, what was Jesus referring to? The signs and wonders and miracles that Jesus performed, that he was demonstrating that he was God, that he could do everything that God could do. The, and so Son points to the prophesied Messiah. This one that would be prophet, priest, and king. I like the book of Zechariah chapter 6. One of the visions that uh, Zechariah saw was of a king with a double-tiered crown. Jesus is priest and king. He would be priest and king on the throne. And so no king was ever a priest also. No priest was ever a king also. Only Jesus is priest and king. And he is that prophet that Moses prophesied would come and be like him, a lawgiver. And so why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? They boast themselves against the Son of God. They shake their fist at the Son of God. But he is God, and he will get the last say, and, and has had the last say in many, many ways. Uh, Father and Son are one. Jesus said when he was about to be crucified, I have finished the work you gave me to do, the completed work of Jesus. He completed the work that God gave him to do, but his work continues as our high priest who ever lives to make intercession for the saints as the one that uh, still is our mediator between God and men who is our advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous and so he is still working on our behalf interceding in our prayers And uh, mediating on behalf of mankind, fallen man, that needs the help of God. Romans chapter 1, Paul begins the letter in a very serious note when he says, He is the son of David according to the flesh. He is the son of God by virtue of the resurrection from the dead. And so this, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was the crowning evidence of the deity of God, of of God's Son. But he is also referred to as the Son of Man. Eighty-five times in the New Testament, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Only one other prophet is called son of man. And God speaking to Ezekiel calls him son of man. I don't uh, get all there is to that uh, tie between Ezekiel and Christ. and Maybe there is no direct tie. But uh, Ezekiel, the only one who is referred to by God as the son of man. And Jesus himself who calls himself the Son of Man. Uh, now, uh, John 1, 14. The Word was made flesh. Here is the Son of Man. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. How was he made flesh? Well, he was made flesh just like you and I are made flesh. He was born of a woman made under the law. Galatians 4 and verse 4. Isaiah referred to this as the virgin birth. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so when Jesus walked the earth, he was God in the flesh, walking among men. He came to do the will of God. He was the God-man. Uh, Paul said of him, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2 and verse 9. 
But why did Jesus become a man? What would necessitated that? The thing that necessitated him becoming a man was the compassion and love of God that saw that without a correct offering, there would be no way that a man could be saved. Jeremiah said, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And though men try to direct themselves, we fail miserably. We do not measure up to God's standard of what walking correctly is all about. But the New Testament, the Bible as a whole, and especially through the New Testament, we are taught how to walk before God and how to guide our steps. Uh, but human beings, we have finite knowledge. We're trying to understand the infinite. And our minds are not equipped to know nor to handle some of the things that the Bible teaches. And that's why a lifetime of study, uh, of scholarly, scholarly research, and delving into as much as we can, we still have a long way to go to know God and to come to the realization of what he is and how he can help us and, and how he does help us. Oh the, uh, oh, the depth and the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past understanding. Romans 11, 33, 3. One of the purposes that Jesus, why Jesus came to the earth was to show us the Father. You remember there in John 14, Philip said, show us the Father, Lord show us the Father, and that will satisfy us. Jesus gave him a little rebuke here. He said, have I been so long with you, Philip, that you do not know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Deity come in the flesh. Yes. God became man to show us the Father. How does he show us the Father? If God is a spirit, how does he show us the Father? He shows us the Father by dis uh, displaying all the attributes of God. Love, grace, mercy, kindness, goodness. All of the virtues of, uh, that God possesses were in possession by Jesus. And he displayed them all marvelously as he walked among men. Peter says he went about doing good. What a... Uh, uh, but Jesus did good on a scale that outstrips any good that uh, we can do. But he showed us the way. He showed us the why. And the how. And so Jesus came to show us the Father. He came, he says, to serve. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. There's a lot in that verse. Jesus came not as the king with a scepter in his hand ruling over his people and treating them as the kings of this world treat their subjects. Even the kindest and the best of kings in the human realm are not able to ro rule and reign as does Jesus. And so Jesus came as a servant. He wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was born in a stable. He was raised in a despised city. Isaiah referred to him as a root out of a dry ground. He said that the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. But he came to serve. Teaching us how to serve. Showing us how to do it. 
with kindness and compassion, without prejudice and without uh, uh, without uh, bitterness toward anybody, but opening up our hearts to all men and all women, people everywhere, to children and to the aged and the suffering and those who are ill, Jesus served. We can't serve in the capacity that he did. We certainly cannot heal as he healed. But we can do the very best that we can to relieve those who need help. And we need to be about our Father's business, don't we? Jesus became flesh as uh, Steve's young son read for us to be our sin bearer. There in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, we have a, 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 in verse 9, he says, For, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than, than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. The sin bearer. Verse 14, he says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. How refreshing is the New Testament? To read words like these and to, to know that Jesus came to help us take advantage of the blessings of forgiveness of sin and to show us what a Savior can do. It is a lot of sacrifice. Of course, he came to seek and to save that which is lost, according to Luke 19 and verse 10. That uh, helps us to know our mission as members of the body of Christ. And we need to be soul winners. We need to be doing what we can, teaching others, helping others. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to do that. I think Jesus in Matthew, or rather Mark chapter 5, when he had healed the man that uh, had been possessed of demons, and the demon, or the de this ex-demon possessed man, uh, afterward told Jesus that he wanted to follow him. But Jesus didn't say, come and follow me to him. He said, go back to your home and tell your friends and your neighbors what God has done for you. You know that's personal evangelism right there. Every one of us ought to be able to tell our friends and our relatives, our neighbors, what God has done for us. It's a, it's a matter of telling them about forgiveness and relief from the burden of sin and free from the heartache Oh yes, we have our problems. Every person will always have problems till this world is over or until our life is ended. But yet, when we think about our life, God has helped us in so many ways. By the grace of God, each of us is what we are. Jesus came to be tested. Though he was a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. Do you think that it, your suffering is a testing? We'll not get out of this world without suffering. Some suffer more than others. But suffering is a part of living. 
That suffering may be taking on the burdens of somebody else. That, may, that suffering may be financially caring for people that you didn't ever think that you would be responsible for. That suffering may come in the form of mental and physical ailments and illnesses. And if you're as old as I am, you've got a few of those. But I'm glad for the time that I've had in this world. I'm glad that, that uh, God has given me almost, well, more than a third of what my parents had. I've lived, outlived them by, since 1964, 1965, that's a long time. But it's by the grace of God. It isn't because I'm such a physical specimen. <laughs> that's a laugh. And so we trust God. We count on God's help. But God's help comes in different ways. Much of my help through life has come through this congregation. And other churches that I have preached for and worked with. God's people are God's helpers. You are serving God in caring for one another. And preachers need a lot of help. You know that. And so God became man. He is the son of man. Lastly, I want to think about Jesus as the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I've never been around sheep much, but when I was preaching out at Salem... Donnie Harris one year had a lamb and that thing would follow you around and just uh, want to be with you all the time just like any pet. I can understand David's uh, God uh, taking such umbrage against David because he was guilty of taking a lamb not the literal lamb but the lamb is spotless and innocent and unblemished. It's the perfect sacrifice for sin. And the book of Hebrews said that he opened not his mouth in his suffering. Anybody suffering that can refuse or resist opening their mouth in pain, calling out for help, appealing to God, or to anything or anyone else to relieve them. Uh, I don't think that you can do it as Jesus did. But he is the sacrifice for our sin. It was determined by God that it would be a blood offering. And so from the beginning of time, Cain and Abel, uh, here is Abel offering an animal sacrifice. And Cain offering a sacrifice that, was, that God rejected. Hebrews 11 informs us that Abel offered his by faith. That means that he trusted what God said in the matter. Faith comes by hearing. And Abel heard and listened to God and obeyed God. And God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's. But then the book of Hebrews also tells us that is, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So it isn't 
the literal lamb. Think of the, think of the animals in the Old Testament that uh, the Hebrew people offered as sacrifices. The rivers of blood. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the, the Day of Atonement and uh, some of these other days had to have been just a gory, bloody scene. Rivers of blood flowing in Jerusalem and other places around Israel and other places where Jews lived. Thank God that we never have to offer animal sacrifices anymore. Think of the sacrifices that the heathen have offered. The blood that has been shed. But it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. A body thou hast made for me. The body was Jesus. He grew to be a man. He became the sacrifice for man's sin, the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. And so John wrote of him, he is the pro uh, propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of all the world. Propitiation is a word not found in the scriptures, I think maybe just a couple times. And uh, uh, Theologians have a difficult time understanding what a propitiation is. But all of them agree that it has to do with satisfaction. When Jesus was sacrificed, Isaiah 53, 10 and 11 said, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. What does that mean? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Well, I, I'm sure that it was not that God was pleased with the suffering that his son was undergoing. But he was satisfied with the sacrifice that he made. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I come to do thy will, O God, and he did it. And God was pleased because that was the only thing, the only sacrifice that ever, would ever take away man's sin. How much we should appreciate Jesus our Lord. It fulfilled the plan of God. Acts 2.20 Three says that it was by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that all of this happened. The foreknowledge of God. Re Revelation 13.8 says he is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And, and so the foreknowledge of God God, Ephesians 3, says that he planned this from the beginning of the world. Before man was created. When the Godhead, before they said, let us make man in our image, they had the plan. And it would involve deity coming to the earth, the word becoming flesh, dwelling among us, and that word becoming the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. Jesus' sacrifice forever ended the need of any animal. Since the cross, there has never been any reason for an animal to be sacrificed. And hopefully the world will someday learn that. 
Jesus shed his blood on the cross. The nails in his hands, the spear in his side, the crown of thorns on his head, and the blood dripping down. The blood, the blood. We're saved by the blood. But how do we contact that blood? Paul said it's in the baptism that we, when we are buried with Christ into his death. Where did Jesus shed his blood? He shed his blood in his death. What happens in baptism? When you go down into the watery grave, you are buried in beneath the water. You are raised to walk in newness of life. If we have been planted in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And so when I want to be saved by the blood, yes, but you have to be baptized. Brother Marshall Keeble used to say there's water in the plan, and certainly that is the absolute truth. You do it by means of a burial in water, but you come up as a living person and not have to give your life for your own sin. <clears throat> we put off the old man and put on the new. And we clothe ourselves. In baptism, we clothe ourselves with Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27. Jesus, the Word, became flesh. He left the Father became a part of the human race for the amount of time needed to accomplish the work that God had sent him to do. And so he was the son of God who became the son of man who became the sacrifice, the lamb of God. If you need to be saved, you need to consider the things that we have said. I know it's a lot to take in, to, uh, but if you, if you have some knowledge and understanding of God, think of the sacrifice that God made in giving His Son, the sacrifice that the Son made in giving Himself. The deity, that a deity would do all of this for a people that are so rebellious and in a, in a sense almost worthless. But we are worth everything as far as God is concerned and he gave everything. We're going to sing an invitation song. The purpose of this is simply to encourage any person man or woman, boy or girl, who understands the sacrifice that Jesus made for sin to, while we sing the song, just to walk up here and have a seat on one of these front rows. Give your hand to me in confession and your heart to God and we will proceed to baptize you into Christ. And you can go on your way rejoicing. Saved, saved, saved. Won't you come while we stand and sing?